Good afternoon, um, Judge Mushwana. Afternoon, CJ. How are you this afternoon? Uh, I'm fine, but a bit exhausted. I just came off uh, four appeals in Ooh. the past two days, but it's fine. I'm, you'll, you'll survive. Yeah, I'm sure I will. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. You have a string of academic qualifications. I remember interviewing you before, and uh, I just get tired looking at the list. BPROC, LLB, higher diploma in labor law, a master's a diploma in corporate law from, a, from various educational institutions, tertiary institutions in this country. What did you do before you became a judge of the Labour Court in 2017 in the legal, legal sphere, briefly? Yes. Uh, before I got elevated as a judge, I practiced as an attorney mm. for a period of about 22 years, if I'm not mistaken. And you had run a practice on your own account? Yes, I did uh, in partnership some instances. Yeah. What kind of work did uh, your practice deal with? I would say we were general practitioners. Uh, we did almost everything that uh, we could or is thrown on us as particularly before the um, or just after the um, I started that firm around 95, so it was shortly after the, the, the new country. So the type of work you would do as a, a middle sort of law firm, uh, it will range from your civil road accident fund, contract, and so on. But I specifically in the firm chose to specialize in labor law. And then you, you develop a special interest in labor law. Yes. When were you appointed uh, in that court? That would be the 31st of May 2017. 2017. Yes. And how have you found the experience? Of being a judge. Of being a judge in that court. Yeah, no, no, it's a, it's a daunting. <laughs> Uh, experience in a sense that um, particularly the labor court in Johannesburg mm -hmm. it's a hectic court mm -hmm. but uh, here I am seven years later it seems I, I, I coped well I, I, I dare say you you have more than coped you, you seem to be thriving if anything oh, here yes. you are co-authoring books and uh, how, how, how did you how did you do that <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, co-authoring the book, it's an interesting story, but I don't want to bore the commissioners about the details. But uh, one of the professors uh, at the University of Namibia uh, was apparently following some of my judgments. And uh, he then made contact with me um, and said, I've read a number of your judgments. I want us to meet and um, share some ideas. And that would be around 2020, thereabout. Then we communicated telephonically and in some instances on WhatsApp. And uh, <coughs> then we agreed that uh, let's put something which is a book related to the court in Namibia and the labor court in South Africa. Mm -hmm. That's how it came about, right. CJ. No, congratulations, that's a, that's a commendable achievement. Thank I envy you, if anything. <laughs> thank you, thank you, CJ. <laughs> we, we, we skipped some important steps. You, you served for four years as a, a CMA commissioner. Yes. Before you, uh -huh, and you had served 
as an, an acting judge in the labor court since um, intermediately since since 2007. Yeah, since 2007. Yeah, I had acted in the labor court. Mm -hmm. um, and you acted in the high court as well. Yes, and I'm currently acting at the high court. Since when? Uh, since the beginning of this year. All right. So, so that's the first time. Yeah. Uh, so you have three terms in 2024. Yes, yes. And so before far. that? Before that, I acted in 2022. Mm. I think it was for a term, the fourth term. How how have you found the the switch to the to the high court where you do more generalist work? Uh, look, I I don't think there was much difference, mm. and I'll tell you why I'm saying that. In the labour court, in as much as you would do, you will deal with employment matters. Uh, you will on occasion deal with contract, on occasion you will deal with your administrative law, and, um, and in some instances a bit of uh, contempt proceedings as a touch of criminal law and all that. So when I transitioned into a high court, I didn't find any difficulty, I must say. Uh, other than be, uh, the fact that I'm no longer dealing with Sidumo all the time. <laughs> I will be dealing with something different. Yeah. But nevertheless, <laughs> uh, motion is motion. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you, I, I see that you've sat in the whole range of courts uh, doing civil and yes. criminal work, full, full court, um, appeals, petitions, motions. Yes, the indeed. Mm. Yes. Um, you've written judgments. Yes. How many? For both, as a, both in the labor court and uh, in the high court? Yeah. The last time I was here, it was you, CJ, who told me that uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, GCBU, they, they were counting about 300 mm -hmm. judgments. And, and that now, was why, so that you've accumulated on that list? Yeah, so I, uh, uh, I was given a list that has at least 40 judgments so far. So if you add that, you would be looking at about 340, if 300 was anything to work with. All right, you've... You're such a prolific writer. You've published other other materials. You have articles um, in the area of of um, of labor law, of course. Where, yeah. where do you find the time to write all these things? Uh, yeah, I think this question also arose on the last occasion. Um, you know, I, I I perhaps I like reading and. Um, as I read, I want to write something. Uh, so I'll spend sometimes a, a lot of time in my study uh, writing something. Right. Okay. Uh, Judge, Mlam, Judge President Mlam, do you have questions for this? Thank you very much, uh, Chief Justice. Thank you. Um, Judge Mishana, um the CJ took you through your work in the High Court. Just to confirm this, uh, my spreadsheet suggests you've done 38 weeks since you started acting in the High Court. Yes, that appears to be correct. But what comes out very clearly is uh, uh, you've dealt with four special motions, that would be special motions each time you've acted, as well as four agent courts. Wrong. Yes. That's Indeed. quite heavy. Yeah. yeah, well, coming from you, JP, is very rich <laughs> to say it is heavy. <laughs> so you blame me for allocating your work to me? <laughs> Who else? Okay. 
and uh, you've done one week of opposed motions. Yeah, I see it's one week, but my recollection is it could be more than that. It should be more, they, they, because yes. uh, I think there are occasions where we would pull you from one yes, yes. on and put you there. Yes, we, I we remember specifically in May. Yeah. Yeah. We put you in the in an in opposed motion in May. Yeah, May. yeah in May in when Jovek. yeah in yeah. Johannesburg. Yeah. Yeah, I dealt with opposed motion. So let's say two there. But the the point I'm trying to make is, as a rule, if you've got a special motion week in one term, we would give you uh, one opposed motion week. If not, yes, we give you one Asian court week. Because yes. if we add those types of week, then we're killing you. You understand that? Yes. Yeah. So, but those are agent, those are complicated work areas. But to you, as a judge already, a seven-year-old judge, uh, there was nothing new in terms of the intensity because the the labor court in Jobek is also busy. True, I agree. Right. And then, in terms of judgments, um, I've given you a list of forty. But the only question I want to ask you about those judgments is. Uh, how long did it take you to write all of, uh, some of those judgments? Did you take 40, 40, more than three months or what? Well, uh, I can just look at one here, the Ramuzuli versus Commissioner of Fossars. Yeah. I had that matter on the 28th of February, 2024, and the judgment was written on the 26th of March. So That's it's, three months. No, no, less than a month. Yeah. Yes. Well, that, that's within the three-month period. Yes, within the three-month yeah. period, sorry. Th that's my assessment, having just browsed through all these judgments, that uh, uh, it took you less than three months. But can you confirm that for, for record purposes? No, no, I can confirm that. Right. So you've never had a problem writing judgments? No, I, I never had a problem. So you're one of those who's never received my love letter saying, where are the judgments? Not at all. I am in the good books insofar as that is concerned. <laughs> okay. Um, just stepping off that, Judge Mishwana, I think the only reason you are here, I want to think, today, yes. is because of uh, the issue relating to your practice last year. Yes. Right. And uh, can you tell the Commission what the situation is? Do you still have shares in that firm? Do you still have, do you have a financial interest in that firm? Are you still involved in, in the firm you, you, were, you had founded? I think just assure us the commission here, because J.P. Wegley has also written here. Um, yes. But that's why you're here today. Can you tell us what's the situation? Okay, thank you very much, um, J.P. Obviously, uh, I did not know on the last occasion, what could have cost my not being recommended, but I cannot. I I, I suspect that that was the issue. So, I'm 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 just going to make two points because I had read the transcript of the last occasion, and um, the two points I want to make is, and the first one very emphatically, I have no interest, and I have no financial interest in that practice. It's been seven years that I have been out of practice, so there is no interest at all, if that was the concern. And secondly, uh, you do mention that um, the, uh, my JP had written, I don't know what he had written to, to, to the JSC, uh, but I did, express the same sentiments to him that um, I have not, and I will make it clear if I am called again, that no financial interest at all. The practice as we speak, I think I left about two partners or three partners, they changed uh, the different partners now. Yes, I think that's what I can tell. Uh, at this point in time. I don't know whether that answers your question. No, it does. Thank, thank you very much, Ashwin Shana. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, JP. Premier? Just, just two questions, maybe to follow up on this. 
what uh, JP have just asked. In the last time, when, sorry, last time when we were here, uh, the matter that uh, JP has just raised was really a serious matter, uh, where it was not explicit uh, that your involvement in that practice uh, cannot be traced back and cannot be confirmed. Uh, that you are no longer part. I'm glad now you're emphasizing that indeed explicitly uh, that uh, you are no longer part. Um, did you take any additional steps or decisions immediately after your last appearance about this matter or it remained as it was? Maybe it was a misunderstanding from our side. Yeah, look, it remained as it was. And I, uh, as I say, I don't want to rehash the debate we had, but the issue was centered around what is being owed and, um, and, and, and that was it. And I think there was a confusion thinking that uh, what is being owed is uh, amounting to some financial interest. So the situation is as is, or as it was rather. The last question, Chief Justice, is for my selfish interest. Why this floor crossing from Methodist Church to Baptist Church? <laughs> uh, Premier, you call it floor crossing, and of course it's a language that belongs to another area. But for me, um, I want to serve the judiciary to the best of my ability. And if I remain in the labor court, I might not have an opportunity to serve the judiciary to the best of my ability. Um, I, I would have been confined, I said, when I started to the Sidumo situation, but at the high court, I'm exposed to many other areas of the law. And I feel that my skills, if, I, if, if at all I have skills, are better placed at the place like the High Court. Sorry, just a oh, follow-up question. I, I didn't get the candidate answering the question. The question had nothing to do with Labour and High Court. It had to do with different churches. Oh, okay. No, maybe I misunderstood. <laughs> that, yes, no. Please repeat the question. The, I'm saying the you churches. Are, you are a staunch member of the Methodists. You yes. just moved to the Baptist Church. I'm trying oh. to understand. Oh, no. Thank and I'm you. just saying it had nothing to do with this. Must just my oh, uh, yes. self-efficient. Well, and why is open Baptist? Is yes. there a closed Baptist? <laughs> No, um, we, some years back, I used to live in Midrand. So the church I would attend there was the Methodist church. Now, then I moved to Hart B.S. Dam. So I couldn't find a Methodist church close by. And the Open Baptist was the closest church to the Methodist church. Sorry, I didn't understand the question earlier. Yes. Uh, Deputy, I'm sorry, you, I didn't realize that you are acting as the president. <laughs> uh, <laughs> acting president, Wondi. I want to refer you to page nine of <coughs> paginated uh, okay. bundle. That's uh, your questionnaire. Paragraph 16.3 and paragraph 16.4. Yes. Now, the question here asks you to list ca cases in which you gave judgments that were unsuccessfully appealed against. And the 16.4 question asks you to list cases in which you gave judgment that were successfully appealed against. 
Now, but you said refer to 2023 questionnaire. But now, unfortunately, some of us were not here in 2023, and I'm not sure if even those that were here are still keeping the 2023 questionnaire. Yeah. No, no, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yes, I referred to that because at the time, and this was my thinking, it was too soon after the, the um, 2023 interviews and not much has, had changed. But I picked up from the uh, GCB that they did uh, pick up those judgment because for me, it would have just been a repetition of what I have I had said at the time, because there was nothing new uh, that was taken on appeal or overtake, uh, overturned on appeal. So that's why I chose that route. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, um, AP. Uh, any questions, colleagues? Commissioner Ngaito. Yes, um, Judge Mushwana, I just want to put some of the <coughs> objections uh, that have ma been made against you. Um, this one is not an objection, but it's a comment uh, flowing from what the JP put to you. Uh, you said you didn't know what Judge President Wagley said. Is that correct? Uh, the JP, uh, Commissioner Ngaito, mentioned the, a letter so I'm not that's why I'm saying I don't know what is what, what the uh, JP Wegley said All right. yes so that's what I, I was referring to, to that yeah no that's what I want to assist you with yes uh, we we had resolved at the JSC that he would follow it up with you to clarify the issue of your apparent ongoing financial interest in your former law firm yes and then he wrote to us in October last year, in which he said that uh, uh, you were either on long leave or busy with your doctorate. But basically, the gist of it was that he, he, he felt he was, it was uh, inopportune to invite you to chambers. And then, and then he gave up and said, let, let the JSC deal with it directly with you. So the, the impression one gains from it is that they, there was uh, some sort of lack of communication between you and him. Uh, is it fair to say that you did not cooperate with him or do you think that's unfair? Yeah, it will be unfair. Why I say so? Shortly after the interview, uh, JP Wegley, me and him, we come a long way and um, he called me and told me about this meeting that you are mentioning. And um, he said that, can you write something for me to explain the position so that I can pass it over to the JSC? And my recollection is that I did write him an email in response to the issue that he say was raised with, uh, with the JSC in his presence and in my absence. You should have that email, I suppose. I beg your pardon? You should have that email you sent to him, I suppose. Well, if I go to my records, yes. I, I seem to recall that I would have shared it with the JP Mlambo as well. But I, I, it's, it's been a long time since. Yes, no, the that only email. concern is not the financial issue, but it's your failure to cooperate with the JP who's been mandated by the JSC to engage with you. That's, that's why I said to you, it will be an unfair statement because I did. And that's why I emphasize that me and uh, JP Wegley worked well together. We've known each other for many years. So he, he had informed me and I wrote an email, which I didn't know that uh, this issue would arise. Had I known, I would have brought the email with me. Yes. The next one is uh, an objection by a Mr. Zulu, who seems to have been a litigant in front of you in respect of a matter that you gave a judgment on the 1st of June 2023 without reasons. He wanted to appeal, 
He asked for the reasons on the 7th of August, 2023, and you did not give him the reasons. Instead, what you did, you asked him to look for the transcript. Uh, uh, what do you say to that? Yeah, I, th I, th I think, Commissioner, that issue, as far as I can recall, has been before the Conduct Committee of the JSC, and yes, they have reached. Appeal. Yeah, they have reached a ruling, and there is an appeal process. Yes. But in short, uh, I gave an extempore judgment, and uh, when the litigant wanted reasons, and I recall my secretary wrote a letter to the litigant and referred to a provision in the practice manual uh, that when they are extempore judgments and you want the reasons, you have the responsibility to transcribe those reasons. So Who has the responsibility? The, the, according to the practice manual. It's the litigant. The litigant, yes. So, so your point is you acknowledge everything, but it was up to the litigant to get the transcript. Yes. Now, I think two points I'm making. One is that it, it has been raised with the Judicial uh, Conduct Committee, and uh, I gave the same explanation, and they ruled that there was nothing untoward. And uh, I understand now, last week or so, I was told that um, there is an appeal by the litigant yes, against the ruling. No, I mean, this is not a misconduct inquiry. It's a, a, an assessment of your fitness uh, for appointment. So this question is relevant despite <laughs> the JCC ruling. All right. Yes. So, but what is your answer? Your answer is that you told them that they can get the reasons from the registrar's office. Yes, that's what the practice manual of the Labour Court says. Yes. And there is a third one, uh, which is from Mr. Makatu who says that you failed to disclose a conflict of interest in a matter of South African custodial management versus, is it APSCO, in which you were a judge? Yes, I recall that one. Uh, that very point was raised up to the Constitutional Court, and the Constitutional Court um, dismissed the application because that was the basis for seeking to appeal my judgment. But nevertheless, the transcript of those proceedings is one matter that I had virtually. I stated, and it was on record, and for that reason, the Constitutional Court ended up marking those uh, applicants with costs, punitive costs, because it was there in the record. What was in the record? The disclosure. Yes, yes. So yes. you're saying factually it's wrong, you made the disclosure. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. That, that will be all, Chief Justice. Thank you, Commissioner Mugaito. Commissioner King? Thank you, Chief Justice. Good afternoon. Uh, afternoon, to, Commissioner. Uh, good afternoon to you. I, I want to uh, take up something that uh, Acting President Zondi raised with you, and it pertains to the references to the judgments in your previous application, your answer was that you gathered that the GCB had managed to access them. Um, may I refer you to paragraph 7.1 of that um, GCB review? And just, um, I could just let you know what they say. They say they didn't have access to- What page? Um, it's at page two of the GCB review, paragraph 7.1. On the paginated documents that I have, if I may be directed to the page. I'm afraid I'm working off an electronic database. Oh, um, okay. I wonder, have you got the GCB review perhaps? Not in front of me. I think you're being assisted, so we'll just yeah. No, let's, let's we'll wait, just, for um, wait a moment. <coughs> what paragraph? Thank you. Paragraph seven point one. Yes. You'll see that um, they say that you referred to your previous application, to which the current reviewing team does not have access. However, the following appears from the review 
of that previous application. So yes. in other words, the GCB looked at the last time it reviewed you and, and uplifted some comments from its previous review, but they too didn't have access to your, um, your previous judgments. Had you read this report? Uh, before you came here? Which report? The, the GCB. No, no, report. indeed I did. That's what, that's what I was referring to. Yes. What they ended up doing was to review the very cases that were disclosed on the previous application. I that's see. why I was referring to. Oh, I see. Thank yes. you for that clarification. Now, on the, on the real-time investment decision, um, you were criticized because you awarded relief which hadn't been sought by the one party and so um, the other party had not even been given notice of that relief. Could you just um, give us your impression of whether that's a fair criticism and, and what you would do about such a situation at this stage? All right, thank you very much. Um, obviously, the LAC uh, considered the matter and took a view that um, because reinstatement was not specifically asked for, then the I, as the quota call, ought not to have ordered reinstatement. Now, it's, it's debatable in my view and for the following reasons. There are authorities of the Labor Appeal Court including the Constitutional Court that says reinstatement is a primary remedy. And the only time that reinstatement may be excluded as a primary remedy is when the provisions set out in 1932 are present. Now, those authorities go further and say the, those circumstances would depend on the evidence that the employer would present. Now, in this matter, I had no evidence from the employer and the finding I reached was that the dismissal was both substantively and procedurally unfair. And the primary remedy which was available to the litigant would have been reinstatement. That's why I went for reinstatement. But obviously, the Labour Appeal Court looked at it from a different perspective. Yes, so in the same situation, you would do the same again? I, I would say, look, given this judgment on application of the stare decisis principle, I am bound by this judgment except if perhaps I happen to sit in another higher court, which in which event I would somewhat express the views that I just expressed. But if I were to return to the labor court and be faced with a particular situation, uh, I'm bound by this judgment. May I ask you also then on the next criticism of um Solomon's case, the next yes. paragraph, if, if I could just ask you a question about that criticism. Um, maybe the easiest way to deal with this is just to ask you the difference between a dismissal of an application for relief and an application for relief being struck off the roll. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Section 138.5 of the Labor Relations Act provides that where the applicant had referred a dispute and that applicant is absent, then the commissioner is entitled or empowered rather to dismiss the referral. Now that's the statutory provision the CCMA rules repeat the same thing that is stated in the Act. So to a point that where 
a matter, if it was in the labor court, for instance, or in the high court, where an applicant doesn't appear in court, ordinarily, the application would be struck off due to non-appearance. Now, in the Solomon judgment, or perhaps before we get to the Solomon judgment, that is my differentiation. Dismissal is dismissing the action, and striking off is simply, for lack of a better way, removing it from the role of matters that were to be entertained on that particular day. Any questions, colleagues? Oh. Do we have questions from the virtual platform? None from my side, CJ. No, thank you, Chief Judge. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Judge Moshwana? Yes, CJ. The interview is done. Is it no done? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Commissioners, thank you for this opportunity.